Future for Archaeological Archives program. Uh, we'll start here with the Mendoza review of museums in England. How many of you are aware of that? God. Okay, a few more. <laughs> um, how many of you actually read it? <laughs> Nobody. <laughs> um, right, so this was prompted by questions in Parliament delivered um, on the, on, to, to bring to, to um, Parliament's attention the ongoing crisis, which has never quite developed into a crisis, of, of museum storage. Not specifically about the storage of archaeological archives, but storage in general and the capacity of museums properly to discharge their duties um, to the general public. Uh, in it, uh, due to some hard work and lobbying from the Society for Museum Archaeology, amongst others, um, Neil Mendoza included uh, a clause delay, dealing with archaeological archives in which he basically um, recommended that Historic England become more involved in the issue and that um, they should make recommendations to DCMS uh, to, uh, to discuss how Historic England were going to approach the issue of the capacity to curate archaeological archives, amongst other things. That became the Archaeological Archives Advisory Board, started up by Steve Trow, who was the uh, person at Historic England taking on this responsibility. He's left since then. Um, and the Archaeological Archives Advisory Board essentially brought together the Arts Council, who are major, uh, quite important um, contributors to this debate, with other the usual suspects from across the archaeological spectrum, uh, CIFA, Algeo, FAME, uh, and then some others perhaps less expected, the National Trust, uh, the Receiver of REC, and others. Um, the idea was to formulate those recommendations that were going to go to DCMS. That happened, and since then, uh, we've transmogrified into the Future for Archaeological Archives programme under the leadership of Barney Sloan at Historic England um, to take forward those recommendations. And you can read all about it uh, on the web pages that we've just uh, put up in the last few weeks. Um, the intention is to follow through on an action plan that is built around the recommendations made to DCMS. And what I'm going to do is talk you through the action plan, <laughs> more or less. Uh, sorry, Doug, I'm going to keep moving around. Um, so, uh, there are a number of things that we want to achieve. One of them is to ensure that there is somewhere to put archaeological archives, physically store them and for them to be curated. Um, the other is to um, enhance that the case for, um, for that to be developed um, by promoting the value and the use of archaeological archives. And then there are various supporting initiatives that we feel are important to carry along at the same time to sort out issues around transfer of title and ownership to enable um, that process to be more smoothly achieved. And that's important if we are to develop a national initiative for archaeological archive transfer and, and, um, and curation, because we can't do that unless issues of ownership are properly dealt with. Um, we want to sort of support our case by explaining to people who aren't archaeologists, and this is the difficult bit, why archaeological archives are important. I don't know 
how many of you work for local authorities, but when I was a local authority museum curator, after almost every election, some new councillor would be asking us, what's the point of keeping all this stuff in this warehouse? And we'd have to tell them again why it was important. <laughs> yes, thank you, Nick. Get me one of those badges, Nick. Um, so uh, so we've, got to, we've got to make that case. And one way of doing that is to, is to assure people that what we're actually collecting and curating is worthy of that being done to it, rather than just putting, taking everything we find, putting it in boxes and dumping it on a shelf, which is what people think we do. And then the other thing is to explore new technologies. This is, um, I'm not going to go into that in very great detail because it's, it's, it's one of the biggest rabbit holes you can end up going down. Some people seem to think that it's possible to, 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 to use new technologies to, um, to replicate archaeological archives without having to put everything in a box on a shelf. Um, and I keep having to disabuse people of that notion, um, but uh, it keeps rearing its head. So that's in there as a, as a means of, um, of, of, of sort of following up on the program that we've uh, put together. Um, so those are the options around those, those objectives. Um, reduce the size of archaeological archives before they are deposited. That's to do with um, assuring people that what we collect and curate is, is worthy of that. We can create space in stores by rationalising existing museum collections, yes or no. Um, and then we can investigate storage options, a model for, um, for actually having somewhere to put everything. And then there's the other option around digital material, which we've heard a lot about this morning. I'm not going to go into that in too much detail, but one of the recommendations to DCMS was around the expectation for museums to curate or not to curate digital material. So this is the Future for Archaeological Archives programme action plan. Uh, it's divided into work packages. This is a properly historic England type <laughs> programme. Um, I'm the programme manager hey, um, at the moment and um, uh, Barney Sloan, as I said, is the, is the sort of executive he likes programs and work packages, and so that's what we've got. But it sort of makes sense. Um, so we've got these different work packages, and I'm just going to gallop through each of them. Um, because I'm the program manager, I've um, introduced colour coding into the, work, into the action plan to make it far more um, uh, visibly appealing to people who get sent it every so often whenever we have a program board meeting so they can keep track of where we are in each work package. So the first work package, establishing the basis for action. That essentially is just making a case for archaeological archives, for their preservation. Uh, it includes um, uh, our sort of liaison uh, with regard to the Mendoza Review, and that is the programme board, so we've achieved that. Uh, DCMS endorsement of the recommendations that we uh, presented to them. The minister, which is probably about two dozen iterations ago, um, did endorse the recommendations that DCMS received from Historic England. And then there's a memorandum of understanding between the Arts Council and Historic England to um, progress the programme board, but also to make a statement about their support for archaeological archives and their future. And that needs to be updated and properly disseminated. So there was an early version of that, but it's sort of out of date now. Um, work package B, establishing the best option for future archive provision. This is probably the only thing you're actually interested in hearing about this afternoon. Where are we going to put everything? Um, 
Well, we started with an options appraisal that was commissioned by the Arts Council and Historic England, um, which looked at, um, so the things on the left, sorry, DCMS 1 are the recommendations made by Historic England. So those, the numbers relate to that and SAP relates to the sector action plan that followed up the recommendations. So we've put those two things together into the action plan for the future Procultural Archives programme. Right, so study patterns of use for collections. I'll come on to that. And making the case for transforming the system. So essentially what we're doing there is looking at options for resolving the storage issue, making the case for archaeological archives to be preserved by investigating how they are accessed at the moment, and then making a case for the option from the options appraisal that we want to follow. So we'll just look at making the case. A couple of projects that Historic England have commissioned, one completed, one about to commence. The first is a report on the use of archaeological archive materials in research. Essentially, UAUK looked at 468 different pieces of postgraduate research that were accessible online um, over the last 10 years and worked out how many of them accessed museum collections. Uh, and the, the answer is 186. <laughs> and they estimate about over three quarters of a million objects were researched in, across those 186 projects at a cost of about 11 million pounds over the last 10 years. Uh, so that helps to make the case. It shows that museum collections are accessed for research purposes at a healthy rate. We're following that up with another project that Historic England's just commissioned with the Society for Museum Archaeology, uh, looking at how museum collections are accessed, museum archaeology collections are accessed um, by people other than researchers, academic researchers. So a number of partner museums are signed up to the project to look at, to collect information rather than go back into their records because they aren't kept in the same ways across all museums. This will be an ongoing survey over 18 months to collect information about people visiting and accessing archaeological collections for whatever reason. And that will then go alongside the previous research report um, to, uh, to support the case for their preservation. Um, the Options for Sustainable Archaeological Archives report, which uh, was produced 2021, set out about four different options for um, how we could address the storage issue. Um, and the one that has been uh, adopted, I'll, co well, I'll come on to that, but it will look like that. Um, so there are two strands to the options appraisal. The first is this, that we should move towards a national collection of archaeological archives. That doesn't mean that all archaeological archives would necessarily be collected in the same place, but museums that currently collect or can no longer collect will be able to sign up to the national collection. And they would feed into, a, a, they would adopt a single approach. So a single online catalogue, um, a data store, which would have all collections information together. Um, a single set of standards for the preparation of archaeological archives. Um, a single collecting policy um, linked to research frameworks. And then uh, there'd be a team of people employed to facilitate all of that. It's a concept rather than uh, an actual physical entity, but it's one that is probably long overdue. I think it's quite imaginative because what it does is it brings um, museums together 
doing the same things for the same reasons um, with the same end in sight. And whether or not they actually curate physically um, and store those archives on their own premises or whether they utilise a national option doesn't really matter. They're still working together. Uh, I mean, nobody can force a museum to sign up to it, but we're hoping that, you know, it'll, it, the, the ball will start rolling and people will see the benefits of doing that. And it should benefit contracting organisations who are trying to work out how to deposit archives um, to different museums because they'll be signed up to the same set of standards. Whether or not they'll all have the same box size, <laughs> Nikki, I cannot tell you. <laughs> um, so uh, the option that um, that we went for in terms of a solution to the storage issue is one big building. Um, that seemed to be the most achievable of the options because um, a regional network would be, if you built four regional stores, that would be four times as more expensive than one national store. Um, and there are issues around ownership and staffing and all sorts of things. Um, originally, the idea was to rent space from uh, the Science Museum at their National <coughs> Science Collecting Centre at uh, Roughton near Swindon. Um, but they are, uh, they've decided they need that space <laughs> themselves. So they've just built this massive building that's just the unloading area, um, and, uh, and they're filling it up. So our aim is to build another one of those next to that one. Uh, the Science Museum people are really keen on having us on board, um, and uh, Arts Council and others are all behind developing a business case for that to happen. I'll come back to that. Um, so work package C is developing the basis for, for best practice in archaeological archiving. I'm mm. doing for time. Um, and there's a number of, number of initiatives that we're following up on through best practice. One is uh, professional standards and guidance. We've seen the release of the Society for Museum Archaeology's latest uh, standard in the care of archaeological collections, um, which you can find online through the SMA <laughs> website. Um, and that is a very up-to-date um, look at not just curation, but also um, how to uh, deal with the deposition of archaeological archives. Um, we've got... Uh, we're supporting that with... Um, with a project that we're currently just about to close tomorrow, I think. Um, uh, a project to appraise, to do an options appraisal of costing models. So at the moment, museums charge by the box. That's pretty much how it goes. Um, we're, we're, we've commissioned a project to look at alternative ways, potentially, of funding um, uh, at the deposition of archaeological archives uh, and there are no preconceived ideas about that um, we just want somebody to look at it one of the reasons for doing that is because in order to develop a new store in order to develop a national collection of archaeological archives that has to be sustainably funded so there has to be to make a case to dcms for the funding to build anything you have to show that the, the money will that the thing will be self-sustaining we're not convinced that um, charging by the box will provide that level of um, guaranteed income it's not easy <laughs> to predict how many boxes are going to be deposited with you every year um, but there are other ways of working it out maybe the cubic meterage of soil extracted maybe the cubic the, the square meterage of a of trenches that are excavated, maybe just how much development is going on 
and how much of that we would need, and how much of the cost of all that development would be required to, so a percentage of overall development costs. Who knows? But we're hoping that somebody will come up with a range of options that we can take to the sector for discussion. Um, it's just, it just doesn't seem very sophisticated to work it out on the number of boxes at the moment. And as we've heard, who knows what a box actually is. Um, so that project will be getting underway uh, in about a month's time, once we've decided who's won the tender. Um, in terms of digital curation, um, again, with reference to best practice, um, the SMA's standard and guidance says quite clearly that museums should not be attempting to curate digital material. They are not digital repositories. They cannot do digital preservation and they should let other people who can do it, do it for them. That message hasn't got through to all that many museums yet, but we're still working on it. Um, so, and we've recommended uh, ADS as the only sort of reasonable um, digital repository that can actually deal with archaeological material and make it accessible in the ways that we'd expect. Um, so there probably is more to follow up on that, but uh, um, that's where we've got to. In terms of um, the framework for legal ownership, Historic England commissioned, uh, well, it's done two things. It sought advice from a QC on uh, what the legal position really is in terms of the ownership of archaeological material. We got a very clear statement about what it is, but it was written by a QC, so it didn't actually... <laughs> it required some translation, let's put it that way. Um, so, uh, uh, and then at the same time, we commissioned a firm of solicitors to prepare for us a model deed of transfer for archaeological archives that we would like to see inserted into the beginning of a project so that um, it doesn't have to be left to the end. Very clear advice from the QC was that the owner of any archaeological material recovered during the course of an archaeological project is the landowner at the time of recovery. So if the landowner changes before the project is completed and you're trying to sort out transfer of title after the landowner has changed, you may not be able to find the true owner of the archaeological material because it will not be the landowner who has, current, who has recently acquired the land. So we thought we needed something, some mechanism for ensuring transfer of title while you still knew who, who the landowner and true owner of the archaeological material was going to be. Um, so I developed a toolkit, because I've done lots of toolkits, uh, for managing the ownership of archaeological finds. Um, but then the Future for Archaeological Archives Programme Board decided that a toolkit was only actually of any use to other archaeologists. And what we really needed, and they're right, is guidance for landowners and for developers and for town planners. So they understood how the process was supposed to work and they could ensure that the, um, the deed of transfer was recognised and became just a, another part of the process. So we're now currently working with Algeo and hopefully through them with town planners to, to come up with a way of, um, of facilitating that. And, uh, and then we can release the toolkit for archaeologists because until we've got landowners understanding it, it's difficult for archaeologists to promote the use of the deed. Um, so we've got collection sustainability, Going back to, is it possible to rationalise museum collections and create space? No, is the short answer from the project that HE commissioned from the Society for Museum Archaeology. It's been out there for a while. Guidance on the rationalisation of museum archaeology collections. 
the general conclusion is that it's more expensive to create the space than it is to build more. So um, you might as well do that. Um, but read all about it in that report. Innovation in archaeological archives, I'm not going to talk about. Selection is an important part of making the case for the sustainability of archaeological archives, ensuring that what we keep and, and curate is worthy of that. And of course, we've got the selection toolkit that was developed um, and that we are promoting and which we'll be hearing about later. Uh, and then reviewing the situation, we've got to make sure that we continue to argue from the latest knowledge available. The Society for Museum Archaeology produced three consecutive annual reports on the numbers of museums currently collecting archaeological archives in England. Anybody seen those? Thanks, Helen. <laughs> Not enough. Um, have a look at them through the SMA website. Effectively, they just give you, they just asked every museum that had archaeology collections, are you still collecting archaeological archives, yes or no, with some supporting questions. And the results um, are increasingly depressing in many ways. Uh, there should be a new survey being conducted probably next year. Uh, we were planning to do a, th a fourth survey uh, in three years after the completion of this one, but um, uh, then there was a pandemic, so we stopped and museums just weren't in a position to respond. So there will be a new survey which will give us up-to-date figures, and we want to keep doing that as long as we're developing the programme. So what should we achieve at the end of it? That's the big question. <laughs> Uh, the future for Archaeological Archives programme should have a finite end point. And at that point, the Archaeological Archives Forum, which is continuing to do its work underneath all of this, um, will continue to uh, take, it, take it up and, and promote Archaeological Archives in the ways that they were doing before. This is a programme designed to achieve this. A national collection of archaeological archives, somewhere to put everything. Um, assurance that we're curating what we're supposed to. And consistent procedures for archaeological archive, including all of those things. We won't have achieved that before I retire in July next year. So um, I'll be handing it over to somebody else. Um, but, you know, with any luck, I might still be alive when we have got a national store <laughs> and a national collection for archaeological archives. Thanks. Thank